the ENCODE papers in junk DNA. The ENCODE, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements Consortium, recently published a number of papers in several journals, including Nature, in a kind of a coordinated mass of publications. And uh, there'll be a list of those other paper, uh, those other journals in a bit. Um, for those of you who want, there's the reference. Uh, this was picked up by various news organizations, including the New York Times, which ran a, an article. And uh, we're going to go through that article. We're going to go through the uh, original announcement. And uh, we're going to look at uh, reactions of various people. The uh, original article, or the, uh, the New York Times article, is entitled Bits of Mystery DNA Far from Junk play a crucial role. And uh, it starts out among the many mysteries of human biology is why complex diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, and psychiatric disorders are so difficult to predict and often to treat. An equally perplexing puzzle is why one individual gets a disease like cancer or depression while an identical twin remains perfectly healthy. Now scientists have discovered a vital clue to unraveling these riddles. The human genome is packed with at least four million gene switches that reside in bits of DNA that once were dismissed as junk, but that turn out to play critical roles in controlling how cells, organs, and other tissues behave. The discovery, considered a major medical and scientific breakthrough, has enormous implications for human health because so many complex diseases appear to be caught, uh, caused by tiny changes in hundreds of gene switches. The findings, which are the fruit of an immense federal project involving 440 scientists from 32 laboratories around the world, will have immediate applications for understanding how alterations in the non-gene parts of DNA contribute to human diseases, which may in turn lead to new drugs, um, or perhaps new lifestyle changes. Uh, just a thought. Uh, they can also help explain how the environment uh, can affect disease risk. In the case of identical twins, small changes in environmental exposure can slightly alter gene switches with the result that one twin gets a disease and the other does not. As scientists delved into the junk, parts of the DNA that are not actual genes containing instructions for proteins, they discovered a complex system that controls genes. At least 80% of this DNA is active and needed. By the way, the exact figure that was given was 80.4%. Uh, so it's at least 80. Uh, the result of the, of the work is an annotated roadmap of much of this DNA, noting what it is doing and how. It includes the system of switches that, acting like dimmer switches for lights, control which genes are used in a cell and when they are used, and determine, for instance, whether a cell becomes a liver cell or a neuron. It's Google Maps, said Eric Lander, president of the Broad Institute, a joint research endeavor of Harvard and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In contrast, the project's predecessor, the Human Genome Project, which determined the entire sequence of human DNA was like getting a picture from, of Earth from space, he said. It doesn't tell you where the roads are. It doesn't tell you where, what traffic is like at what time of the day. It doesn't tell you where the good restaurants are or the hospitals or the cities or the rivers. Although it might tell you the ri some of the rivers anyway. Um, the new result is a stunning resource, said Dr. Lander, who is not involved in the research that produced it, but was a leader in the Human Genome Project. My head explodes at the amount of data. The discoveries were published on Wednesday in six papers in the journal Nature and in 24 papers in Genome Research and Genome Biology. In addition, the Journal of Biological Chemistry is publishing six review articles, and Science is publishing yet another article. Human DNA is a lot more active than we expected, and there are a lot more things happening than we expected, said Ewan Burney of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, European Bioinformatics Institute, a lead researcher on the project. 
In one of the Nature papers, researchers link the gene switches to a range of human diseases, multiple sclerosis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, and even to traits like height. In large studies over the past decade, scientists found that minor changes in human DNA sequences increase the risk that a person will get these diseases. But those changes were in the junk, now often referred to as the dark matter. They were not changes in genes, that is, things that code for proteins. And their significance was not clear. The new analysis reveals that a great many of these changes alter gene switches and are highly significant. Most of the changes that affect disease don't lie in the genes themselves. They lie in the switches, said Michael Snyder, a Stanford University researcher for the project called ENCODE for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And that, said Dr. Bradley Bernstein, an ENCODE researcher at Massachusetts General Hospital, is really a big deal, he added. I don't think anyone predicted that would be the case. Well, maybe there were a few who predicted it. Um, <coughs> the discoveries can also reveal which genetic changes are important in cancer and why. As they began determining the DNA sequences of cancer cells, researchers realized that most of the thousands of DNA changes in cancer cells were not in the genes. They were in the dark matter. Uh, the challenge is to figure out which of these changes, of those changes, are driving the cancer's growth. These papers are very significant, said Dr. Mark A. Rubin, a prostate cancer genomics researcher at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Rubin, who is not part of the ENCODE project, added, they will definitely have an impact on our medical research on cancer. In prostate cancer, for example, his group found mutations in important genes that are not readily attacked by drugs. But ENCODE, by showing which regions of the dark matter control those genes, gives another way to attack them, target those controlling switches. Dr. Rubin, who also used the Google Maps analogy, explained, now you can follow the roads and see the traffic circulation. That's exactly the same way we will use these data in cancer research. ENCODE provides a roadmap with traffic patterns for alternate ways to go after cancer genes, he said. Dr. Bernstein said, this is a resource like the human genome that will drive science forward. The system, though, is stunningly complex with many redundancies. Just the idea of so many switches was almost incomprehensible, Dr. Bernstein said. There, were, there also is a sort of DNA wiring system that is almost inconceivably intricate. It is like opening a wiring closet and seeing a hairball of wires, said Mark Erstein, an ENCODE researcher from Yale. We tried to unravel this hairball and make it interpretable. There's another sort of hairball as well, the complex three-dimensional structure of DNA. Human DNA is such a long strand, about 10 feet of DNA, stuffed into a microscopic nucleus of a cell, that it only fits because it is tightly wound and coiled around itself. When they looked at the three-dimensional structure, the hairball, ENCODE researchers discovered that small segments of dark matter DNA are often quite close to the genes they control. In the past, when they analyzed only the uncoiled length of DNA, those controlling regions appeared to be far from the genes they affect. The project began in 2003 as researchers began to appreciate how little they knew about human DNA. In recent years, some began to find switches in the 99% of human DNA that is not genes but they could not fully characterize or explain what a vast majority of it was doing. The thought before the start of the project, said Thomas Gingras, an ENCODE researcher from Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory, was that only five to 10% of the DNA in a human being was actually being used. Keep that number in mind. The big surprise was not only that almost all of the DNA is used, but that also that large a large proportion of it is gene switches. Before ENCODE, said John, Dr. John Stamatoyanopoulos, I think, uh, a University of Washington scientist who was part of the project, if you had said half the genome and probably more has instructions for turning genes on and off, 
I don't think people would have believed you. Keep in mind that this is the general scientific consensus before ENCODE. By the time the National Human Geno uh, Genome Research Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health, embarked on en ENCODE, major advances in DNA sequencing and compu computational biology had made it conceivable to try to understand the dark matter of human DNA. Even so, the analysis was daunting. The researchers generated 15 trillion bytes of raw data. Analyzing the data required the equivalent of more than 300 years of computer time. Just organizing the researchers and coordinating the work was a huge undertaking. Dr. Gerstein, one of the project's leaders, has produced a diagram of the authors with their connections to one another. It looks nearly as complicated as the wiring diagram for the human DNA switches. Now that part of the work is done and the hundreds of authors have written their papers. There's literally a flotilla of papers, Dr. Gerstein said, but he added, more work has yet to be done. There are still parts of the genome that have not been figured out. That, though, is for the next stage of ENCODE. That's the press release that got out. Now I'm going to give you the um, uh, a little blurb in Nature that kind of introduced all the papers uh, by Magdalena Skipper and company in Nature uh, on 6 September. Um, and it's entitled Presenting ENCODE. 2001 will always be remembered as the year of the human genome. The availability of its sequence transformed biology and the exemplary way in which hundreds of researchers came together to form a public consortium paved the way for big science and biology. It was an incredible achievement, but it was always clear that knowing the code was only the beginning. To understand how cells interpret the information locked within the genome is much more needed to be learned. This became the task of ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, the aim of which was to describe, to describe all functional elements encoded in the human genome. Nine years after launch, its main efforts culminate in the publication of 30 coordinated papers, six of which are in this issue of Nature. Collectively, the papers described 1,640 data sets generated across 147 different cell types. Among the many important results, there is one that stands out above them all. More than 80% of the human genome's components now have been assigned at least one biochemical function. Keep that in mind. The most important result, the one that stands above them all. The implications of the ENCODE findings extend to many fields in biology. In the news and views forum on page 52, scientists representing five different areas of research share their views on what the results mean to them and their work. On page 49, Ewan Burney, the leader and coordinator of the ENCODE Consortium, discusses the challenges of doing consortium-driven uh, science. He called himself in another place cat herder in chief. Um, related issues are explored in a careers feature. Uh, dizzying amounts of data have been produced by the ENCODE project and are openly accessible. Countless more analysis are therefore to be expected in addition to the multitude that are now being published. Finding a balance between data collection and analysis is a topic of a news feature. The papers which are freely available to all and the articles in this issue are complemented by an extensive range of outlined online features. Among them are interactive uh, figures in the overview uh, and code paper, which also featured a virtual machine to allow you to interact more closely with the data and their analysis. In line with the community spirit with which the work was undertaken, we also present online the related papers published in genome research and genome biology. To help you navigate through this, uh, the data, we have created the Nature ENCODE Explorer and we introduced threads which allow you to explore biological themes between the papers. We hope you enjoy the package. Now, fascinating. Question that I have, was it really that unexpected that most DNA would have a function? Well, that depends on who you are. For most scientists, I think it's a fair statement to say, 
that it was. For intelligent design advocates, it's a fair statement to say it was not. First, um, we will let um, the enemies of intelligent design, I think it's fair to call them that, they certainly would put themselves in that category. And um, we'll start with the Huffington Post, John Farrell. And uh, I'm not going to obviously go through all of these uh, things word for word, um, but I will try to uh, give as much of the sense as I can in their own words. And uh, so we'll try to stick with paragraphs and um, uh, skipping down to where I think uh, it becomes interesting here. The myth of junk DNA is published by Discovery Institute Press, branch of the Discovery Institute, the creationist funded organization in Seattle for which Jonathan Wells works. The book makes two claims. The first is that since the 1970s, avid Darwinists have assumed that all non-coding DNA was functionless junk and that this was further evidence for a notoriously unguided process of evolution. Uh, but now, to everyone's surprise, Wells argues, researchers are finding that most, much of the non-coding sequences in the human genome turn out to have interesting functions after all. This, is, um, this article is a review of the book, The Myth of the Junk DNA. And in Chapter 5, for example, pseudogenes not so pseudo after all, Wells cites recent research showing that some pseudogenes, no longer functional duplicates of coding genes, are turning out to have real functions. This is fine. But he fails to point out what a trivial percentage this represents against the 20,000 other pseudogenes and transposable elements littered through the genome for which scientists have found no apparent functions. So he's saying, yeah, here's a function for this gene, pseudogene, that pseudogene, but most of them don't have any function, right? Pseudogenes themselves and the genomic minority Nearly half the human genome consists of transposable elements, DNA sequences that can make copies of themselves. One such transposable element, called ALU, is present in more than one million copies in each human genome. At the end of this chapter, the reader is left with the misleading impression that biologists are well on their way to finding functions for the entire human genome. So if I hear correctly, this reviewer who is critically reviewing a book that says that most of the DNA is probably going to wind up having a function, He's saying, that's crazy. Most of it doesn't have a function and probably won't in the future either. In contrast, as a genomic specialist like T. Ryan Gregory, whose work on genome size wells walks around very gingerly indeed, have long pointed out scientific views in the proportion of the genome that is functional and diverse, um, are diverse, I'm sorry, and that discussions among functions for all sorts of DNA elements have been prominent in the scientific literature for decades. You would never learn this from Wells' book. Um, okay, so scientists have different opinions. And... It sounds a little bit like... Uh, the logic is not crystal clear there. Genomes with no junk, for example, do not necessarily imply intelligent design. They would fit quite well with the views of those biologists like Richard Dawkins who argue that natural selection really is a prime driver of evolution. Because if junk DNA really were functionists, presumably natural selection would have weeded out those organisms that had too much of it. I think Richard Dawkins has on record as saying 97% of DNA is junk. Um, yes, you could argue that natural selection would get rid of junk, but I don't think I would use Richard Dawkins as the person to argue that. Um, again, the, the logic here is uh, perhaps a little fuzzy. Indeed, this has been the default assumption for many biologists since the discovery of DNA th uh, that does not dis encode proteins. This has been the default assumption. So can somebody explain to me why the ENCODE people were all surprised that uh, the number reached up to 80% that they could find a function for? Um, 
it, from the New York Times article anyway, it would appear that the consensus was that maybe 5 to 10 percent would have a function. Um, on the other hand, the presence of copious amounts of junk DNA fits well with those biologists who think that other mechanisms of evolution, such as genetic drift or the spread of transposable elements, are major drivers of genome evolution, and that much apparently useless DNA would pass on from one generation to the next as long as it was not overly harmful to reproductive fitness. So there, you know, scientists have different views. Uh, I find it fascinating that his example of the view that uh, there should not be too much junk DNA is Richard Dawkins, whose percentage is publicly, or was publicly, 97%. Um, now, here's somebody that's a little more neutral. Um, but obviously not an intelligent design advocate, as he makes clear from the first part of this paragraph. Uh, I'm not advocating intelligent design here, though it certainly doesn't hurt the case that one might make for it, but noting that when we make broad assumptions based on a crude extrapolation of a rather general theory, we can find ourselves far from reality. But uh, doesn't nothing in biology make sense except in the light of evolution? <laughs> Um, there's nothing in the above discovery that an evolutionary biologist can't accept or f for, of course, but uh, can't count for, I'm sorry, can't read. Um, but the fact that it's surprising on the standard evolutionary narrative heretofore ought to be remarked upon and not swept under the rug. He goes on to say, mark a point for intelligent design proponents here. They've long predicted that junk DNA would prove not to be junk. It's only fair to notice it. Then uh, another comment, uh, this one uh, by Dave Ross. Those of you who listen to the radio may have heard of him. Um, Intelligent Design Gets One Right is what he is entitled, uh, this particular uh, post. And he says, among other things, I once, in fact, I think this is the beginner, beginning of his post, I once interviewed a supporter of intelligent design. This idea that humans are too complicated to have simply evolved on their own. And I asked him, where does this get you? If you need to take the Bible literally, that's your right, but how is this science? How does it change the way we would actually study biology in the lab? He said, the junk DNA. What do you mean, I asked him. Uh, the huge... Um, Stretches of DNA between the genes that don't seem to do anything in which scientists have therefore named junk DNA, he said. An intelligent design scientist would assume that there is no such thing as junk DNA, that it must have a purpose. That was several years ago, and so this week I see a headline in the Washington Post. Analysis debunks concept of junk DNA. Uh, this is the Washington Post, not the New York Times, but, you know, same idea. It reports the results of a nine-year project to sequence not just genes, but the stuff between the genes. 400 scientists sequence the three billion bits of information packed into each cell. The English version of Wikipedia has mere 2.5 billion words. That's the entire Wikipedia. So that's a lot of information. And the researchers concluded that the so-called junk DNA between the genes is in fact more important than the genes because it controls them. It turns them on and off at precise times, depending on the cell they're in and the job to be done. They turn out to be the brains of the cell. Now, does this prove that God is somehow at work here? No. But you have to admit that it was pretty arrogant of tr traditional scientists to initially dismiss most DNA as junk. Especially now that the so-called junk turns out to be the most intelligent part of the human cell. And uh, just for a little perspective, this is Panda's Thumb, uh, not exactly a creationist site. Um, and this is dated 2010-05, and for what it is worth, uh, it's entitled Junk DNA is Still Junk, and it's by P.Z. Myers. Those of you uh, who are acquainted with the uh, blogosphere in this particular area may recognize the name. 
And uh, I'm just going to quote three paragraphs. It's a long thing, but um, re remember this is before the news came out. The ENCODE project made a big splash a couple of years ago. It is a huge project not only to ask what the sequence of a, a strand of human DNA was, but to, to analyze, to analyze, uh, that's right where they, how they put it, and annotate and try to figure out what it was doing. I'll cut him some slack since uh, you know that uh, I have a little trouble with my own typing. Um, <coughs> one of the very surprising uh, results was that in the sections of DNA analyzed, almost all of the DNA was transcribed into RNA, since, uh, which sent the creationists and the popular press into unwarranted flutters of excitement that maybe all that junk DNA wasn't junk after all, at all, if enzymes were busy copying it into RNA. This was an erroneous assumption. As John Timmer pointed out, the genome is a noisy place, and coupled with the observations that the transcripts were not evolutionarily conserved. You see, nothing that is in biology that doesn't fit with evolution makes any sense. That's not quite the way it was stated before, but um, <coughs> Coupled with the observations that the transcripts were not evolutionarily concerned, they obviously couldn't have a function if they weren't. It suggested that these were non-functional transcripts. And then again, we're going to skip down a little bit. Well, score one for the more cautious scientists and give the creationists another big fat zero. I think that the score is somewhere in the neighborhood of a big number requiring scientific notation to be expressed for the scientists against a nice, clean, simple zero for the creationists. A new paper has come out that, the analy that analyzes transcripts from the human genome using a new technique, and uh-oh, it looks like most of the early reports of ubiquitous transcription were wrong. And um, there are clearly some mysteries in there. They do not identify a few, they do identify a few novel transcripts that come up out of the intergenic regions. But they are small and rare, and the fact of their existence does not imply a functional role since they could simply be byproducts of other processes. The only way to demonstrate that they actually do something will require experiments in genetic perturbation. The bottom line, though, is the genome is mostly dead transcriptionally. The junk is still junk. Now that's Panda's thumb as of 2010. Has anything changed in the people who are looking at this kind of thing? Well. Uh, let's turn back to John Farrell, who wrote that um, Huffington Post thing. This one's on Forbes. And I just uh, uh, copied and pasted this here. Reports of junk uh, DNA's demise have been greatly exaggerated. And uh, a number of biologists were annoyed this week when the press release for the ENCODE project's latest findings proclaimed that 80% of the human genome is actually has a function. As T. Ryan Gregory of the University of Guelph points out, most of the major media outlets ran with the press release and proclaimed the revolutionary discovery that junk DNA isn't junk after all. The key point of misunderstanding, as both Gregory and Larry Moran at the University of Toronto point out, uh, Larry Moran uh, is, uh, I think you could call him fairly an evolutionary evangelist. Um, <coughs> Uh, point out is that the ENCO team, headed by Ewan Burney, this decided at the outset of their announcement to define biological function in as liberal a way as possible. Here's Gregory. Uh, notice that this is their rehash of the other people's definition of function, not the other people's definition itself. To get that 80% figure, you have to have a very loose definition of function indeed. Actual evidence, which itself may not convince many experts, suggests 20% is functional in the sense of, well, having a, sp having a biological function. The 80% value refers only, only to specific biological activity. Um, I'm not sure what the difference between function and specific biological activity is, but um, whatever. As, and as to what the project's findings haven't changed, even after five years, $185 million, and a massive study by hundreds of researchers, there still is only evidence of function for 80% of the human genome under the most extremely generous interpretations. That leaves 20% without signs of function whatsoever. Just watching this 
slowly crumble. And we're going we're gonna to see somebody kick that, that little thing. Um, there's, that's more than 600 million base pairs, or about 200 million more than the entire puffer fish genome. Moran believes the ENCODE announcement has caused a lot of damage. And I'm inclined to agree. Well, you know, from his perspective, I think that's correct. Scientists have a responsibility to be scrupulously accurate when they present their own work to the general public. That means they should recognize the difference between the, what the data actually says and their own interpretation of the data. When scientists know that there are other ways to interpret the data, they are obliged to mention that. I have a question. Does that apply to public schools as well? Hush my mouth. That's the mark of a good scientist. In this case, Bernie is well aware of the controversy over interpreting pervasive transcription and the possible insignificance of a DNA binding site. He knows that because the ENCODE consortium was challenged in 2007 when it presented the results of the pilot project. And um, there's a reference that he gives. This is, unfortunately, another case of a scientist acting irresponsibly by distorting the importance and significance of the data. Um, we've never seen that from the true believers, have we? Um, like Ida, maybe? Um, it's getting to be a serious problem, and it makes it hard to convey real science to the general public. The public will n now believes that the concept of junk DNA has been rejected by scientists and that our huge genome really is full of wonderful, sophisticated control elements regulating the expression of every gene. <coughs> and that's terrible that we should believe that, I think. And the problem with that is... Pardon? And why is that a problem? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and why is this a problem? I, I mean, they're lamenting as if they lost a little dear friend. I mean, uh, uh, wh what's going on? Uh, maybe it was a dear friend. Okay, well, <clears throat> here's another little item all about science.org junk DNA. And uh, this one is a little more friendly to intelligent design, but I think that the argument is well placed. Junk DNA is Darwinism a science stopper. Neo-Darwinism holds that new biological information arises as a result of a process of mutational trial and error, predicting that there will be a tendency for non-functional DNA to accumulate in the genomes of eukaryotic organisms. The theory of intelligent design, on the other hand, predicts that most of the non-protein coding sequences in the genome should perform some biological function. This is one area in which intelligent design, far from being a science stopper, as Darwinists often claim, actually encourages scientific endeavor. From a Darwinian perspective, we expect a lot of useless DNA. Conversely, if organisms are designed, then we should predict as much as possible of DNA to exhibit function. Interestingly enough, in this situation, it is the claims of Darwinism, not intelligent design which is responsible for acting as a science stopper. Why are you looking for function in that stuff? It's not there. It's a waste of time. <coughs> Discouraging Question. researchers from looking for functionality of so-called junk DNA. Yes? I have a problem with this entire premise. You see, supposedly, Darwinism suggests that there should be junk DNA. But let's think about this a little bit. Why should there be junk DNA if evolutionary paradigm is supposed to be correct? Should, it, should evolution not eliminate useless and pointless energy consuming uh, material? Obviously. Uh, uh, you would think because so. Because it is there at a price. Therefore, by mere evolutionary pressures and natural selection, anybody who lost it 
would be at an advantage. There is no reason why junk DNA, if it was junk, would be preserved. Yes. Um, but actually... That's, that's thinking like uh, the devil's advocate here. It, it's, it is the devil's advocate. And the interesting thing of it is that, that was brought up, you may remember, earlier. And the example that was used of a person who should believe this is Richard Dawkins, who obviously doesn't, or didn't anyway. Um, there's another article uh, this time. I'm, I'm stealing from uh, uh, Geoscience Research Institute. Um, uh, this is by Tim Standish, and it's called Rushing to Judgment, Functionality in Non-Coding or Junk DNA. And uh, he starts out by noting that uh, uh, the uh, discovery that much nuclear DNA in eukaryotic cells does not code for proteins was quickly interpreted as evidence for the evolution of eukaryotic genomes. Papers were published suggesting a nomenclature reflecting evolutionary assumptions about this junk DNA. Non-coding DNA was also used as evidence for the selfish gene theory popularized by Richard Dawkins and others. Uh, as many important functions played by non-coding DNA have come to light, the assumption can no longer be made that it represents DNA potsherds of evolution. Now, I want you to notice this article was written considerably before ENCODE came out, or at least the latest version of ENCODE. Um, now the assumption of functionality, um, I miss catching that, uh, uh, in what was once called uh, junk DNA is widespread, but its interpretation within a Darwinian framework remains. Thus, what was once touted as evidence of life's evolutionary history because of its lack of function is now interpreted as evidence of the same thing because it is functional. This experience calls into question how much data actually unambiguously support Darwinian evolution, what evolutionary theory actually predicts, and how data can be used to check its predictive power. And uh, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to quote a passage that he quotes from Gould in 2001. Our uh, 30,000 genes make up only 1% or so of our total genome. It's actually about 1.5% so. The rest, including bacterial immigrants and other pieces that can replicate and move, originate more as accidents of history than as predictable necessities of physical laws. Moreover, these non-coding regions, disrespectfully called junk DNA, also build a pool of potential for future use that more than any other factor may establish a lineage, any lineage's capacity for further evolutionary increase in complexity. If you don't have junk DNA, you, don't, you can't pull new enzymes out of it. <coughs> Much of the excitement surrounding, and this is, we're back to uh, uh, Standish himself. Much of the excitement surrounding non-coding DNA appears to have been misdirected. In many respects, the history of non-coding DNA resembles that of vestigial organs. I can't say that enough. Uh, evolutionists expected, uh, accepted the assumed lack of function of non-coding uh, DNA as evidence supporting their worldview, even though a lack of function is not necessarily a logical deduction from evolutionary theory. Furthermore, an assumption of function does not have to follow from the idea of design in claiming that non-coding DNA supports evolutionary theory. Predictions of functionality reasonably based on that theory had to be ignored. Darwinists defined what they thought a designer would do and then presented non-coding DNA as violating that prediction. In doing that, three mistakes were made. Number one. Terms of the argument were unfairly constrained by defining the designer in a way that seemed to be contradicted by the evidence. If a designer exists, he is not compelled to fit any definitions his creatures may want to impose, especially not those definitions that preclude his existence on the basis of what he created. Designers can do whatever pleases them. If, it were, if this were not so, it would have been reasonable to question that automobiles with functionless fins from the 1950s were designed by intelligent beings. <laughs> a second error involved treating the hypothesis that non-coding DNA lacked function as if it were well supported by the data 
when there were little data. Worse still, the hypothesis was invoked as if it were a fact instead of a tentative interpretation. If non-coding DNA is functional, then the argument that a designer would not have included functionalist junk in the design becomes irrelevant. Uh, in fact, it may be even a predictive feature of uh, design theory. The final failure was neglecting to examine evolutionary theory to be sure that it does not that it does not predict functionality. This failure resulted in a false dichotomy between the predictions made by design versus those made by Darwinism. It might be argued that in this final error some latitude can be given as evolutionary theory does not always make clear predictions. In fact, it frequently appears to be more robust than other ideas because it can be adjusted to predict whatever the data happen to say, which is another way of saying it's a useless theory if you can't predict. Um, <coughs> As long as non-coding DNA appears functionless, this is what evolutionary theory predicts. But if it is functional, then evolutionary theory provides an equally accommodating framework uh, in which to fit the data. The uh, history of non-coding DNA serves as a cautionary tale illustrating the danger inherent in ignoring the predictive value of one's paradigm. Careful evaluation is needed before jumping on a new trend and claiming that it supports one side or the other of the creation-evolution debate. In attempting to discredit creationists, Darwinists ignored the prediction of functionality made by their own theory and the lack of supporting data. Rushing to judgment is never a wise first step when examining the predictions of competing theories in the absence of sufficient data. And then finally, little... Uh, thing from Discover Magazine, and again, we're not going to go over the whole thing, but this paragraph is particularly choice. And what's in the remaining 20%? Possibly not junk either, according to E1 Bernie, the project's lead analysis coordinator and self-described cat herder-in-chief. He explains that ENCODE encoded uh, only, only, looked at 147 cell types of cells and the human body has a few thousand. A given part of the genome might control a gene in one cell type, but not others. If every cell is included, functions may emerge for the phantom proportion. It's likely that 80% will go to 100%, says Bernie. We don't really have any large chunks of redundant DNA. This metaphor of junk isn't that useful. And then, interestingly enough, when Discover got through writing this nice uh, article, they apparently got hit by your friendly Darwin uh, uh, bots, um, the people who've been arguing this. And you'll notice this is a little update. Um, Bernie was right about the skepticism. Gregory says 80% is a figure only if, you if your definition is so loose as to be all but meaningless. You may remember reading something to that effect. Larry Moran from the University of Toronto, and we've seen his name appear. Functional simply means a little bit of DNA that has been identified in an assay of some sort or another. That's a, remarkable silly, a remarkably silly definition of function, and if you're using it to discount junk DNA, it's downright disingenuous. Well, some of those functions are a little bit more than just simply it, but, um, and then um, um, uh, finally, nature itself had somebody answering these things, and it and they said, among other things, it's an old argument. That's the uh, argument about junk DNA, but it's not clear that it's a dead argument. Several researchers took issue with ENCODE's suggestion that its wobbly 80% number in any way disproves that some DNA is junk. And you can see this is a reaction to Larry Moran and company. Um, Larry Moran argued on his blog that claims about disproving the existence of junk gives ammunition to the creationists, who like a tidy view of every letter in the genome having some sort of divine purpose. This is going to make my life very complicated, he writes. And I guess the question I have when I read that is, uh, is life supposed to be arranged so that Mar Larry Moran's life is not complicated? Um, 
So it gives ammunition to creationists. Does that make it wrong? Indeed, the papers have caught the attentions of at least some creationists. And they has a link, link to somebody who put up a 10 minute, or it's a, I think it's eight and a half minutes, something like that, uh, thing on, uh, junk DNA, or on what DNA does. And of just about everybody else. This is uh, in, in part designed by the project leaders and editors who organized the simultaneous release of the publication to maximize their impact. This was a major time-consuming event that occupied a great deal of time from the scientists involved and from the editors of their respective journals. And the delay that this coordination caused has led to another complaint. Casey Bergman uh, tried to tally the cost of this delay in the scientific community. You see, the papers should have been published one at a time instead of all together because then people could have reacted to it better or something. I guess they they made this for uh, so that it would have major impact. I, I'm not sure what's wrong with that. Well, well, I think the they were hoping that if individual little subsets of information were revealed one at a time, that would provide people with ample opportunity to argue about it for lack of completeness. Maybe adjust you know, to it something. This is one of those issues that many of us have to deal with with peer review who frequently ask us to do yet another experiment or well you need to do uh, this or that in order to support what you have uh, shown here further. So the idea is that you can't publish partial uh, evidence because it's not complete enough. Right, but if you publish all of it, all of it, then, then you're then dumping you have, everything. Then you have employed strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe uh, the appropriate thing to do in that case is to uh, employ strategy. Well, I'll just give you my own, my own quick take on that, and uh, there are obviously other things that can be said. Uh, I think the reasonable functions have been, in fact, found for the 80% of the genome. Um, as I read them, they're not trivial functions. Um, I think that this is probably a conservative figure. I think that as time goes on, we are going to approach 100%. I don't think we'll ever actually get to 100% for the simple reason that if we did, we would all be identical to Adam and Eve. And uh, uh, I think there's been some degeneration in the meantime. So, you know. Uh, if, if we get past 99.5%, I will be surprised. Um, evolutionary evangelists are, at least in my opinion, on the wrong side of history, and it's kind of interesting to watch them try to deal with the information that's coming at them. Now, I don't think that evolution is disproved any more than I think that creation would be disproved by having large amounts of junk DNA. We do live in a fallen world. Um, I would be surprised that it's uh, uh, that it would be you know uh, eighty five percent junk, but on the other hand, I uh, I expect some junk, and um, and I think that an evolutionary perspective can leave room for both uh, uh, both views as well. I think though that there is one thing that is important: an evolutionary evangelist view needs the junk. Because if you kind of try to say, not only am I right about, uh, not only am I right objectively about evolution, but you really should be acknowledging it too, then you need some kind of a hook with which to batter your opponent. And uh, they do need that. And I think that that's why you see the evolutionary evangelists reacting most vigorously to this, because they need it. And I think finally that it is more comforting to be on the side expecting function in DNA, especially given today's data. Now with that, I will uh, uh, invite other comments and, and questions on the subject. Okay, we have one and you want to pass it back. Yes, Ariel. I was just curious, can you do science without having a philosophy of origins? 
believing in evolution or creation? Can't you just do tests, collect data, and let people draw their own conclusions? I would hope so. Uh, certainly there are people who try to argue against that. Um, I, would, I would hope that even people who have evolutionary creationist uh, 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 leanings of one kind or another, even strong leanings, would feel uh, that, that it is appropriate to look at the other guy's opinions and then it's appropriate to go in and in as unbiased manner as possible to try to look at the predictions of both sides and see if they're testable, and if so, to test them. I would think that would be uh, true of a scientist regardless of which side of any particular issue he came, came down on. I would hope that if scientists were the majority of which don't believe in astrology, were disputing astrologers, that they would do their research in such a way that astrology was given a fair shake. Because if you don't do that, then all you're doing is propaganda. Hopefully for the right side, but who knows? And it's worth about as much as propaganda is worth. I would just add to your comment that uh, I think we should always try to be as fair uh, to the data, to the hard data, as possible. Uh, because that is uh, what is uh, more tangible and we're more sure of, uh, fortunately, that hard data, which we just saw some of today, uh, although we maybe some questions on, on this 80%, uh, does very strongly point, and I, I'm surprised that uh, this has not come up here, uh, what is the mathematical probability of getting all these switches to work properly at the right, I mean, uh, so you make a switch, but it's got to work at the right time. I mean, what, uh, I mean, this, this complicates the, the possibility of life arising by itself to, 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 to something beyond comprehension. I mean, we've already known before. I mean, how could you get DNA? I'm not speaking of DNA itself, all the information on DNA, uh, uh, just by chance. I mean, uh, and to me, that this uh, makes the, the, the concept of a designer all the more plausible on the basis of the hard data. Uh, I'm not speculating here from a religious point at all. I'm just looking at it, you know, hey, what are you going to do for all this? Well, that's true. I mean, finding out that it's as complicated as it is. And even if you dispute their number of how much of it is, in fact, uh, uh, you know, if it's 20%, that's a huge number of data points that you have to deal with. Um, and I don't know, it just, it, it's sort of, in a certain way, it's like turning on the computer and then saving little bits of ones and zeros that happen to be in favor of a particular program, and then turning on another computer and saving those bits of data and then recombining them, and eventually you'll get the program. Um, it seems to me to be the same kind of, and, and, and saving them with no idea of what kind of program you really want. Oh, this looks good. Oh, that looks good. Without ever really defining what good is in this particular situation. And so yeah. we want to go from Microsoft <laughs> Word to Microsoft Office, and this is how we do it. We start out with Microsoft Word, and we add little pieces of functionality here, and pretty soon we have PowerPoint, and pretty soon we have Excel, and we have, you know. Mm. 
Well, there are people who think that that's how Microsoft does it, and sometimes the way Microsoft acts, I can understand it, but I don't think that's quite the way Bill Gates uh, runs things. Uh, this does not uh, solve all of creation's problems, but it does very strongly suggest there is a designer. And once you admit you, there's a designer, your whole horizon has to change. Uh, in terms of interpretations, in terms of communication, in terms of uh, would not that designer give us some information? Uh, is the Bible a possible message from that designer and so on that that door is open? And this is a logical door to follow. Well, I think that's the reason why it's fought against so vigorously. In fact, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, I think, let the cat out of the bag. He really doesn't mind intelligent designers as long as that designer is accounted for by natural selection <laughs> or by natural processes of some kind. If, if the designer points outside of the universe, then that just, that's not acceptable. And, and the fact of the matter is that if you admit intelligent design, it does start to point that direction. And I think that's why People are fighting against it when logically there's no reason they should. But, but isn't the multiverse outside of our universe? Yes. So, um, if there's a designer there that, but see designers there can't influence our universe, supposedly. So we can talk about multiverse, but nobody in any of those other universes can be bright enough to think or do anything back. Well, we, we can, but see, we can't influence them, and they can't influence us. There's a wall between us. <sighs> so, uh, um, uh, you mean to say that no intelligence is ever allowed to somehow transcend the individual universe? I think that there'd be people that'd be very uncomfortable with the idea that there's an intelligence that transcends the universe. So we're proposing a theory to explain <coughs> everything by the evolutionary method in order to support the evolutionary method, i.e. the multiverse theory, but we don't like the idea of actually having a way to confirm it because it would undermine the very uh, <laughs> concepts that we stand for, or is, is, that, is that the way the reasoning goes? I, I think that the philosophy is that we should be alone in the universe, that there should be no other intelligence that can influence what's going on. There can be other intelligences, they don't care. But ones that are actually going to influence what's going on with our universe, that is verboten. Just a minute, pass the mic so we can catch this. I thought Hawking said that the multi-universes made it likely that evolution would be the uh, cause. That's, uh, that's what I, uh, maybe I misread it, but that's the th feedback I had gotten. I missed the first part well, no, of that, that sentence. That the multi-universes would explain what we can't understand here. <coughs> that the chances of this life starting spontaneously mm -hmm. would be enhanced by the fact there are multiple universes mm -hmm. and making, you know, infinitely number of chances available. That's the way I understand he uh, thought. No, that is correct. In fact, the most, uh, multiple universes is used to solve the problem of the extreme improbability of life starting on its own. Um, yeah. I think we need to keep in mind that the hard data evidence for the existence of multiverses is about zero. Well, it is almost by definition zero. That's the whole point, is that we can't interact with the multi-universes. If, if, if we could interact with them, they would be part of our universe at that point. 
I guess it was, uh, I thought that the multiverse was to get us a universe, this one, that was friendly to life, not to explain how it arose. But you need more than friendly to life. No, I understand that, but I, I, I thought that the multiverse theory was to select from an infinite number of universes one that had the right characteristics so that life could arise. I don't know of any, anybody that suggested that the multiverse in some way brings about the creation of life, but I could be wrong on that one. Well, uh, what, it, what it boils down to is, let, let's say that the chances of you getting life are one in a million, even given a good universe. Okay. Uh, so basically you need to win the lottery. So what you do is you buy a million tickets, and then you'll win. Um, and if it's a billion tickets, then you buy a billion universes. And if it's 10 to the, 10 to the 123 universe uh, tickets that you need, then you buy 10 to the 10 to the 123 universes. So anything, anything that's improbable enough, if you try enough universes, eventually you'll get it. My, my response to the multiverse uh, idea is that I find it so metaphysically extravagant that uh, I can't wrap my mind around it. I don't know that metaphysical extravagance is um, a, a recognized scientific term, but if it isn't, it should be. Uh, well, it's, I, I think it's the opposite of elegance. It's the opposite of elegance, yes. I have a question back there. For a simple person, I like NPR, who told me there is no center to the universe and no edge. That explains it all to me. However, in my simple thinking, I began to ask, if scientists are getting back in time, very close to the Big Bang, have I missed that they have also gotten back to the location of the Big Bang? If the universe is expanding, from where is it expanding? I, I think that the answer that they would, that they would give is that uh, mathematically it, is, it behaves like it's expanding from any particular point you pick, any arbitrary point. My understanding that metaphysically the where is created at the moment of the Big Bang. Uh, Prior to that, there's no where. Well, number one, the where is created, but number two is that mathematically you can pick any point later on as the where. Oh yeah, later and on it, you can. But and uh, and, and uh, everything expands from that point, everything expands from here, everything expands from on Earth, but if you were over in uh, Betelgeuse or the Andromeda galaxy somewhere, it would look to you like it was expanding from there as well. A rather general reflection on what you've presented, it seems to me that it falls into the same category as the extreme unlikelihood of the friendly, universe friendly to life arising by chance. Um, now the, the genetic complexity suggests that even after we've got a, friend, a universe friendly to life, that um, the chances of everything falling into place um, are so infinitesimally small that um, I think you're left with uh, either God or chance, and obviously we wouldn't be here if we didn't choose God. It's an, I, it never ceases to amaze me when I listen to astrophysicists talk about how fortunate we are that the moon hit uh, the moon is the appropriate distance from Earth, and the tides make it um, easier for life to come into existence. And of course, the forces of nat the forces of physics are all lined up for us. Right. Well, now you've got all of this to add to that, and science is getting very close to proving that it's it's got a wall there that it's it's come across that it's never going to get across. I mean, it's come up against and it will never be able to break through 
Um, and it's just getting worse and worse each year as and more and more of these fortuitous coincidences are, are discovered. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, hearing that uh, somebody won the lottery. And then three weeks later, the same person wins the lottery. And then three weeks later, the same person wins the lottery. Somewhere in there, you're starting to ask, <laughs> is there some hanky-panky going on? <laughs> there's, some kind of there's, a, there's an intelligent designer there somewhere. Even though, you know, one particular aspect of that you can kind of accept as the, you know, we, we won, but we're winning again and again and again and again. And somewhere you start to say, no. Th this is not, you know, there, there comes a point in scientific experiments where you arbitrarily draw the line and say, you know, with a p-value of greater than less than 0 0.05, or perhaps if you're dealing with multi multiple variables, a p-value of less than 0 0.01, or, you know, something. But this is like a p-value of, you know, less than... Uh, <laughs> Less than the number of particles in the known universe, and since we don't know how big the multiverse is, That's right. it may be greater than the number of particles in the multiverse, too. Yeah. And at that point, you're starting Enough. to ask, you know, why don't we just take the obvious conclusion? You know, the, 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 the game is fixed. But they, obviously they're not going to. But um, the, there is an, an alternative that you haven't mentioned, which I think in it probably would be fair to mention it, and that is um, one of the possibilities which I'm sure that um, evolutionists would not be happy with, but which clearly must exist, is that there are still processes that are capable of doing this that we don't know anything about. Clearly the processes that we know about aren't. But what's to rule out the, the possibility that at some point in, in the future processes will be discovered that may be capable of producing this sort of complexity. It's got to be allowed as a, as a hypothetical. Uh, and, I, and I agree with that. The only thing of it is that I think that making that hypothetical possibility more uh, probable than a designer seems to me to be uh, you know, somebody who is willing to take anything other than a designer. And I'm not sure that that's a good scientific attitude. If there's a designer, we need to be open to that possibility. And if the evidence weighs in that favor, then I think we need to acknowledge that evidence. And I think that, you know, I, if somebody can come up with, you know, um, on the origin of life, there was that famous Harvard study, which is funded, I think, what, 10 years ago now, that was going to find out what the origin of life was in five years? We were we're still to, waiting. We were going to cure cancer 20 years ago. You know, at, at, some point, at some point, I think it's fair to say, you know, when you come up with your evidence, I'll believe you. Um, um. I, I, I appreciate the, the argument about the possibility of some unknown process being at work. However, that is not what Darwin proposed. He was proposing chance and natural selection. And what we need to do is to figure out whether those two tools are sufficient to explain what we're looking at. And in the meantime, we'll throw in genetic drift and, in... And in the meantime, sure, if anybody comes up with some conceivable process, by all means, let's look at it. But why do we throw out God? Simply because there might be something, some other way to explain this other than him. Well, at here, some future time. Here's, here's the thing that's interesting to me. Darwin is famous, or Dawkins is famous for saying that 
Uh, biology is the study of complex organisms that give the appearance of having been designed. And really, evolution is an attempt to explain that appearance. In other words, there is a prima facie case for a designer. And the truth of the matter is that what we're trying to explain is why that apparent design really isn't design at all. Now, maybe they're successful, maybe they're not, but I think it's fair to say that those who accept the idea that maybe things look designed because they are, it, that that is at least a reasonable position to take. And I don't think that anybody should be persecuting scientists because they take that position. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, are there any other predictions intelligent design is making currently other than there is no junk DNA? Um, uh, well, one of the softer predictions is that functionality in terms of protein structure will be found to consist of islands that are not all connected by isthmuses uh, that you can't get from one functional protein to another functional protein to another functional protein and, and in nice smooth uh, ways without there being seas of non-functionality that you have to navigate by uh, by pure chance. See, the, the advantage that Darwinism had was that as you keep moving things along, that they stay functional all the way along. Or that you change from one kind of bacteria to a different kind of bacterium, and there are little bitty steps that each one of them will be helpful, and, and so you can move from bacterium A to bacterium B. Then you can move from bacterium B to perhaps a eukaryotic cell. You move from eukaryotic cell to uh, multiple eukaryotic cells living together, to multiple cells with different cell types, to multiple cells with uh, creating bilateral symmetry, a backbone, um, and as things go on, you can keep on doing that one little step at a time. Uh, and one soft, again, it's a soft prediction, it's not a hard one, and one example wouldn't destroy it, but uh, it would certainly put strain on the theory is that you won't find those little tiny steps. That, for example, there aren't five different mutations that can get you from a stegosaur to a um, tyrannosaur. Or five different mutations that can get you from a lizard to a, um, uh, uh, an opossum. <laughs> that, it, there's, that, that there's these islands of lizard where there are a lot of lizards that can live on the island of different kinds, but that there isn't a nice smooth road from lizard all the way up to uh, uh, all the way up to opossum. So that's sort of a reverse irreducible complexity, sort of. Your yeah, it's 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 sort of a, a side effect of irreducible complexity. That what happens is that the organism wants to live on the highest part of the island, the most fit part. <coughs> And then once it gets beyond this way, it slips under the waves and it has to travel underwater or float on the seas until it gets to the other place. <laughs> to, uh, would, would you say irreducible complexity is also a prediction of intelligent design? Um, again, it's a soft prediction. Uh, intelligent design is perfectly uh, capable of having irreducible complexity. It could live without it, but it probably wouldn't be very persuasive without it. Very much, I think, like junk DNA, um, evolution can live without junk DNA, but it's not exactly what, junk, uh, what evolution would have expected. Um, because you need something to be afloat in that sea until it can reach the next island of functionality. And if nothing 
if nothing is allowed to get uh, to float in that sea, then then uh, then there's no way to get to the next island. You can't evolve from one creature to another unless either you have a lot of stuff that will allow you to kind of raft there, so to speak. And that's what junk DNA is, is basically it's rafting material. Um, actually, we have one that's been here a little bit longer, but... Uh, uh, okay, well, well, we'll give it to you and then back to her. Go ahead. You have them. Well, in this august group, maybe somebody could explain this. In reading to try and understand all this, it's my understanding that the mutations that are predicted by Darwinian evolution need to add new knowledge and need to make things better than before. And that's Somewhere that, along the lane, they need to do that. Yeah, and so that makes natural selection work. Right. But the number of useful mutations are pretty rare. Yes. Is that, is, am I understanding uh, it? Depending on who you're quoting, it's somewhere between a thousand and a million to one. Okay. So at least. And we've got a comment over here that's been waiting. Thank you. Uh, I, was, I was just wondering if one of the reasons those that believe in evolution aren't interested in in any kind of evidence for creation is because of the picture that we have given of God. I mean, because the, the God we give the picture of is, is, um, is absolutely almost ridiculous, you know, it's uh, hellfire and, and all these kind of things. Uh, I know when I first became a, I used to be an atheist and I first became a Christian, a pastor was telling me, well, the only reason there's dinosaur bones out there is because God had put them out there to, to test us, <laughs> to, see, to see if we would believe it, you know. But there really weren't any dinosaur bones except for the ones that God put out there. So, so we, we said so many ridiculous things about God that it's, it's, it's hard to want to even think about somebody like that uh, behind creationism. Well, I think you're right. I think there is a, there is a, certain, amou a certain amount of the anti-God movement that Christians in general uh, and uh, uh, sometimes even we as Christians are responsible for. Um, uh, one of the more famous uh, people in the uh, evolutionary uh, uh, sphere right now went to Christian school and wound up, at least according to what I understand, uh, being abused uh, sexually as a kid in a Christian school. Well, that doesn't endear one to the teachings of that kind of uh, group, and if one sees that as representative of Christianity, I, you know, I might be in the same position. So I think one of the things we need to do is be very careful of trying to say that all of these people are always just rejecting God because they are evil. Sometimes they're rejecting our picture of God because our picture is evil. Right. Go ahead. Um, to, to answer the question that Brother asked earlier, are there any other predictions well, uh, and the other brother has mentioned something along those lines, and that is the, um, that you, you have logical consequences of the two approaches. In one case, you're starting with very primitive, and you're supposed to expect higher and higher complexity to be emerging. In the other case, you started out of creator's hands, and it was good, it was very good. In other words, it was optimized. Everything was functioning, like when you buy something, you want it to be brand new, not a demo, right? And it want, you want it to be working perfectly. 
If it doesn't, you get extremely annoyed. So, and as a result of that implicit assumption from the design argument, it means that we have been degrading since then. So is there any evidence to support one or the other model? Well, today we know there is not a single population geneticist on the planet who will say that the genome of any species is improving. In fact, the genome of every known species is degrading over time. So whose prediction is being upheld here? Even though those very same population geneticists will not say that this disproves evolution. In fact, they will vehemently argue against that implication. But the evidence itself speaks very loudly. Every one of our cells, every day of our lives, the DNA that we have in each one of our cells sustains between 40 and 50,000 lesions in every one of our cells. And each one of those has to be repaired. The, the, the most modest, the, the humblest bacterium has more than 200 different mechanisms for the purpose of repairing and maintaining the integrity of its genome. And yet it's losing ground, it's losing territory over time. With eukaryotic cells, things are much more complicated and much more sophisticated in the attempt to maintain the genetic integrity. And yet we're losing territory over time. Each new generation has between 40 and 50 new mutations in it, and they do not help. And that's a low estimate. And that's a low, well, that's... Uh, the, um, the numbers I've seen a range conservative from 60 estimate. to 60 Some to people estimated as much as in, in several hundreds, but yeah. uh, we don't want to go there. Let's, let's work conservatively. So the question is, how many generations? It, it, it reminds me of the verse in the Revelation which says, but if the days were not shortened, there would be nobody left. Now that could mean several things. Mm -hmm. It could mean that we are so prone to killing one another that quite literally we would kill everybody. But it could also mean even in the absence of any hostility, we're all dying. We're dying as organisms and as individuals, as entire species, as entire ecosystems. There are no exceptions. Even the bacteria are subject to the same decay. Kind of gives more meaning to that the groaning that Paul talked about of all creation, longing for a new day. Well. Next week, we'll, we'll probably dive into some more other stuff. Did you have something to say? Go ahead. I just wanted to make a bright remark. Uh, maybe we're just all winding up for the next Big Bang. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, unless I get a big surprise, we'll be back in the book. <laughs>